Let us pray. Lord God, may we learn to lean on your strength in those moments of weakness, in those times where we realize how fragile we really are, at the times when life or the world seems too big for us. May we know your comfort. May we know your protection. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I was growing up, my dad seemed like a, uh, a formidable force. You know, I could go and I could wrestle with him and, you know, it, it only took maybe one hand for him to kind of be able to pick me up and put me to the side. And even as I grew, you know, there is still that, that mental image of, of him being, you know, big and strong and, and powerful and, you know, even as I grew to be his size and even as I grew physically stronger than he was, you know, there's still that, that image in, in your mind of, but here is the one who for years and years had protected me, had given me a safe home, had given me a place where I could feel secure. And then when he was the age I am now, that illusion was shattered. I had come home, I had uh, been on alert for the army, and I had come home finally at Thanksgiving in 1998. And the cancer that he had, had, had wasted away his body. And although he was he was still living at that point, he uh, he seemed very frail. He couldn't stand for very long. He couldn't. Uh, I remember he was frustrated that day. He couldn't even open a jar or or do things to help out in the preparation of of the meal that day. And it's not just not just my father, this is a reality that happens to even the strongest and the most powerful among us. Over the last uh, couple months, I've been reading the, the story of, of Ulysses S. Grant, um, the, uh, the commander of the armies of the North as they, at the point where they won the Civil War and eventually President of the United States. And so he's had this the 16 year span in his career where he has just been ascending time after time after time and then he finishes his time as president and he is the first real president who goes kind of on a world tour and and begins the what will become a normal act for later presidents where they become active in diplomacy on behalf of the United States they become people who are now sent to, to various areas to to negotiate treaties or to, to be a moderator. But he finally returns to the United States. And, and again, this is the, the Gilded Era, so there's a lot of money that's flowing around from the railroads, from oil, from, from a lot of different things. But even this, this person who seemed like he'd ha done all these different things one of his fatal flaws is that he trusted too easily. And there was an individual who convinced him to go into business with him and convinced him to not only invest his money, but his wife's money and his son's money. And it ends up being the first Ponzi scheme in the United States, so not only Grant and his family, but many others who trusted in this scheme because of Grant 
find their fortunes have disappeared overnight. And that a person who had once, you know, believed he had thousands and thousands of dollars to his name in the late 1800s, all of a sudden is immediately forced to be selling off his property, forced to be finding a way to provide for his family. And at that very moment, also, he discovers that he also has cancer. And so he spends the last year of, of his life writing a memoir he didn't originally want to write because he didn't want to, to lift himself up like so many others had done. But he's writing it so that there is a future for his wife, for his family. And so he spends his, his last days, often four to five hours a day, either writing or dictating um, as much as his... Uh, because the, the cancer is in his, his tongue and in his throat, as much as his voice will allow him to finish up this, uh, this memoir so that there may be a financial future for his family. But here's this person who had been at the very pinnacle. You know, he had been the commanding general of the armies of the north. He had been the President of the United States. And yet, at the end, he he's bundled up in clothing, has a scarf wrapped around his throat and a cap on his head, trying to stay warm as he tries to finish this last piece and he holds on until he finishes it and, and several days later, he passes away. I think sometimes we've been taught to trust in our own strength. And, you know, I think there is this belief that we can do it. And then sometimes we're confronted by things that are just so much bigger than us. You know, and it doesn't have to be the, the, the literal storm, although... I've seen the impact of, of a tornado. I've seen the impact of a tropical storm. I've never lived through the impact of a hurricane. I've seen what wildfire can do to a community. I've seen all these, I've seen a lot of things that happen that, that nobody could have prepared for. You did your best, and yet the reality is that in the end we are, we're mere mortals even the best and the strongest of us, even the wisest, even the most powerful, even the wealthiest. We find ourselves caught in the midst of waves that we can't control. You know, as Jesus goes out with his disciples, he's exhausted. He's been, he's been healing, he's been teaching, and so his disciples pull him into the boat. They set out to the sea. Now, most many of them are fishermen. Many of them know this, these waters. They've, they've fished them probably most of their lives. They know how to handle the small craft that they're a part of. And yet even they, with all their skill, with all their knowledge, are overwhelmed by this force which resists them by the waves which are swamping the boat. And even they feel fear. And so they go and they, they wake up Jesus. And Jesus speaks the simple words. Peace. Be still. The waves stop. The wind ceases. And the disciples wonder, who then is this that is in our midst? Because only God can do this. Only God can make the waves to cease. Only God can make the, the winds to grow calm. So who then is this among us? I'm reminded of a story that's told about uh, John Wesley, who's the founder of the Methodist Church. 
So when John Wesley was coming to the United States, he was on a um, on a boat with a bunch of of Mennonites who'd come from Eastern Europe. They were not Mennonites, um, Moravians who'd come from Eastern Europe. They're they're close uh, cousins of of Lutherans, but they were coming across the waters and they come upon a storm, and Wesley is panicked, even though he's a Anglican priest at this point. He is unsettled by this, so he goes down and he sees these Moravians, and they are in the hold, and they're just praying. And so throughout the rest of the journey, he sits with them, and he comes to understand their way of understanding the way in which God holds things in God's hands. And and so this is, becomes kind of a, a capstone moment for him where he begins to realize this is how God is at work in the world, and that there are many times in which all we can do is rely on our Heavenly Father's strength. I th- I'm okay with the reality that I'm not the one who has to bear every burden. I'm okay with not always having to be strong enough or smart enough or wise enough. I'm okay that I'm a part of something that is bigger than myself. And I think part of this Part of what this, this this adventure that the disciples are on on the sea or this catastrophe that the disciples find themselves in the midst of on the sea and Jesus' ability to speak to the sea and quiet it down is a reminder of ultimately who we serve. Ultimately who is in control. And that doesn't mean we aren't going to encounter things that are too big for us. It doesn't mean that there aren't going to be times when we feel like our faith is pushed to its very limits and all we can do is cry out to God. And yet we believe that God hears us. And that God protects us and cares for us. And may we, in those times where our strength is not enough, may we make space for God's strength, which comes in in our weakness. Thanks be to God.